thought we'd get started with uh, Dr. Hazlett. Okay. Thank you. It's great to be here, and I just want to thank Anthony for uh, inviting me. Um, and it's Friday the 13th, so it's appropriate that we talk a little bit about schizotypal personality disorder. Um, so I'm going to present some data that's been collected over many years. Uh, and I'm going to start by acknowledging all the collaborators, in particular Larry Seaver, who's been a wonderful mentor to me as well as many of my colleagues in the room. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about schizotypal personality disorder, which we don't talk as much about at this meeting, so it's kind of nice. Uh, a little bit about the advantages of studying schizotypal personality disorder, a little review of prior work, um, a little bit um, biased in, in a lot of the work done by our group. Um, so studies looking at function volume and uh, white matter connectivity. I'm going to propose uh, the Seaver-Davis model of frontal lobe sparing in schizotypal personality disorder, which we'll revisit again at the end. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of our most recent findings that are unpublished. A little bit about treatment implications, some work by uh, one of our collaborators, or one of the people in our group, uh, Margaret McClure. Um, I'm not sure why it's doing this spacing. I guess I should have paid more attention. Um, keep in mind that I'm going to be asking this question. Do people with schizotypal personality disorder have a protective brain mechanism that mitigates full-blown psychosis? That's sort of my um, idea based on the Seaver Davis work and a lot of our prior imaging work. So we're going to, you're going to hear that as a recurrent theme. Um, and does this frontal lobe mechanism perhaps mitigate full-blown psychosis in people with schizotypal personality disorder? Uh, so here's sort of your typical schizotypal uh, cartoon from uh, The New Yorker. Um, in order to be diagnosed with DSM-5 uh, schizotypal personality disorder, you have to have five of the nine criteria. So as you can see, he looks a little paranoid. He looks a little uh, inappropriately dressed. Um, his behavior and appearance is a little bit odd. He's sitting there on his birthday and he doesn't have any friends and he looks a little anxious. So that's our typical uh, schizotypal personality disorder individual that we recruit here at Mount Sinai in New York City. It's not so hard to recruit these individuals. <laughs> um, this is a typical ad that we would place in maybe the Village Voice or on Craigslist. Do you feel out of step with others? Do you feel nervous, uneasy? Uh, do you sometimes feel that other people are taking special notice of you? Do you find it difficult to trust or feel close to others? And so on. Um, so this is how we recruit our individuals. Um, these are not inpatients um, at Mount Sinai. These are people out in the community not seeking treatment. Uh, so what are some of the advantages of studying schizotypal personality disorder? Um, first of all, this disorder is characterized now in DSM-5 as a schizophrenia spectrum disorder, so it can help provide insights into studying schizophrenia. The advantage of studying schizotypals for sure is that it avoids, at least when you're studying a community sample, it avoids confounds of chronic medication administration. Most of our patients are medication naive. Uh, they haven't been hospitalized and they're not psychotic, so it's easy to have them do cognitive tasks, for example. Um, I think studying schizotypy provides for discovery of risk and protective factors for more serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia. Uh, and our MRI studies examine the pathophysiology and hopefully help us develop targeted treatments um, for schizophrenia spectrum disorders, which we'll get to at the end of my talk. Uh, we've been studying schizotypal personality disorder really for over 100 years, starting with Kraepelin, who talked about eccentric personalities um, in families of people with schizophrenia. He talked about probably for the most part um, these family members are people with latent schizophrenia. And he talked about most such relatives probably suffering from a disorder essentially the same as schizophrenia itself. Um, in 1911, Boiler talked about schizophrenia having, really talking about an RDOX approach in a way, talking about dimensional aspects of schizophrenia uh, existing in various degrees and shadings over the entire scale. Uh, from pathological to normal. And he said, if one observes the relatives of our patients, one often finds in them peculiarities which are qualitatively identical with those of the patients themselves. So giving credit to uh, those guys who would, if they were here today, would be definitely doing MRI studies at Mount Sinai. Um, 
So going back to 1997, um, another mentor of mine, Monty Buxbaum, and I actually, when I first came to Sinai, um, did some studies with Larry Seaver as well and showed that people with schizotypal personality disorder had higher um, regional cerebral blood flow in middle frontal regions during the Wisconsin card sort. Uh, and they showed better task performance um, if they were using this region of their frontal lobe more than healthy people. Uh, 1999, we published a paper that was on the cover of the American Journal looking at the thalamus. And interestingly, these people with schizotypal personality disorder didn't show abnormalities in the thalamus, which has very important connections in the medial dorsal nucleus, this part of the thalamus that's like right here that has uh, important frontal connections. So, so their thalamus seems to be normal when um, in schizophrenia we found very low glucose metabolism in that area. Um, and also another study with glucose looking at um, performance during the California verbal learning test, a serial verbal learning task, showed that um, schizotypals had higher glucose metabolism in Broadman area 10 of the dorsal lateral PFC. So people with schizotypy had higher glucose and blood flow in their frontal lobes. So this then resulted in the Seaver and Davis sort of seminal paper proposing that really the frontal lobe is a protective mechanism perhaps in, in schizotypy. Uh, social deficits, cognitive impairments seen in the entire spectrum of schizophrenia-related disorders are the result of underlying genetic diathesis that in conjunction with modifying environmental factors adverse, adversely affects cortical structures in uh, temporal lobes and frontal lobes. But they went on to say in schizotypy, the frontal lobe buffers against the deficits and the dysfunctions of perhaps the temporal lobe and other brain areas. Okay, so marching forward in time, we published some findings in uh, 2008 showing that in addition to the uh, activation studies, people with SPD showed larger volume in the DLPFC in certain regions of the DLPFC, particularly in Broadman area 10, which you see on that bar graph. So bigger volume in certain areas, which um, in that paper um, we discussed the fact that this may be a protective factor for these individuals. Um, more recently, looking at functional connectivity using a, a technique called diffusion tensor imaging, which allows you to look at white matter integrity. Um, Mark Lenner, who was a uh, resident at Mount Sinai, and I looked at um, white matter tracks in the frontal lobe, which you can see here, the corpus callosum up here, and, sh and found that really schizotypals compared to controls had abnormalities in the frontal white matter tract up here, but in comparison to schizophrenia, they were much less uh, marked, much um, uh, less severely abnormal compared to both schizophrenia and people um, who were healthy. Um, more recently, one of our MIREC fellows, Chi Chan, looked at some DTI data as well uh, in just healthy controls in people with schizotypy and showed that schizotypals do have abnormalities in the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which is shown here, compared to healthy people, and also in the sagittal striatum, which is another tract that really connects, both of these tracts connect frontal and temporal lobes. So compared to healthy people, they show abnormalities. In this, in this study, we didn't have a schizophrenia group, but um, probably they'd be less marked than schizophrenia. Okay, moving to task-based fMRI work, Harold Koningsberg, who's actually here in the front row and our next speaker, showed that people with schizotypy showed greater fMRI bold response in right middle frontal gyrus, Broadman area 46, during a visual spatial working memory task. And interestingly, they didn't show behavioral deficits on the task. So schizotypals have been known to show differences in working memory. Um, cognitive impairment similar to schizophrenia but less marked. Uh, but in this study, it's possible that by using their frontal lobe more, that helped them compensate and they didn't show any behavioral differences. Uh, in 2008, we, we showed that schizotypals also um, showed excessive fMRI activation in frontal striatal thalamic regions during a attention task, like a sustained attention task um, that also involved pre-pulse inhibition, um, some psychophysiological measurement. Uh, 
Um, and basically the idea here is that they showed more activation in these regions during a condition they were supposed to ignore. So they sort of excessively allocated their attentional resources when they didn't need to. Again, maybe a strategy uh, for compensation. And then our, um, our friends at Harvard, Sean Lee Dickey et al., have also showed um, greater bold response in schizotypals in the superior temporal gyrus in the temporal lobe. So more recently, we've uh, done some resting state functional connectivity, which you may have heard about, the default mode network, which is shown here, which is a network in the brain that primarily involves medial frontal cortex and also the posterior cingulate. And there's a whole literature on a default mode network in schizophrenia, but very little work done in, in schizotypy. Um, lower default mode network activity has been shown to be associated with better performance on stimulus-driven goal-directed cognitive tasks requiring external attention. This is work by Alan Anasevic at Yale. Uh, suppression in this activity is, is perhaps thought to be required to disengage from mind wandering and provide a filter to successfully complete cognitive demanding operations. Hyperactivity in this uh, default mode network has been shown in schizophrenia, so we looked at this in schizotypals. Uh, and this dysfunction is also thought to be related to negative symptoms. So. Um, in schizotypals, I could only find a couple of studies. One in people psychometrically at risk for schizotypy showing hyperconnectivity of the frontal lobe, and one in real schizotypal diagnosis um, showing the opposite. So kind of a mixed literature. We looked at this in our schizotypal sample, which I've already told you a little bit about. This is a little bit more about how they're diagnosed. Um, they all met criteria based on the SIDP. Uh, unmedicated, uh, mostly never medicated, age matched, gender matched. They weren't matched on education, so we use that as a covariate. Um, I'm going to skip this part about the image processing. Basically, what we find is hyperconnectivity in the frontal lobe that, that you can sort of see here. So, hyperconnectivity in schizotypals compared to healthy controls uh, in this frontal default mode network. Um, this was also correlated with symptom severity in the schizotypal group, so more uh, hyperconnectivity was associated with more SPD symptom severity, which you can sort of see right here. Okay, and then also recently we've looked at sort of, based on some of the work done at Yale by Alan Antasevic, looking at sort of this idea of thalamic temporal connectivity, which has been shown to be abnormal in schizophrenia. So we put a seed in the thalamus, which you see on the left here, and looked at connectivity between the thalamus and the rest of the brain, really. And what pops up in the schizotypals is that all the areas that you see are orange are more active in schizotypals compared to healthy controls. So again, this Hyperfunctional connectivity is seen in schizotypal personality, particularly in the middle temporal gyrus uh, of the front of the temporal lobe, uh, compared to healthy people. So, just building on the pathophysiological model of Seaver and Davis, um, I think we're showing the same kind of pattern um, more than 10 years later since that paper was published. But it's a little bit. I would, I would tweak it a little bit. So I would say that frontal lobe reserves do prote potentially protect individuals with schizotypy from decompensating into florid psychosis, but also that the temporal lobe is very important. So temporal lobe abnormalities are core to both SPD and schizophrenia, but less marked in schizotypals, and this thalamotemporal hyperconnectivity may be a protective factor. Uh, so just talking about conclusions. Um, Early work indicates larger volume hyperactivity of key frontal regions in SPD. Overall in SPD, we observe default mode network, but not these other network abnormalities. So they basically show less marked connectivity abnormalities compared to schizophrenia. Resting state findings are consistent with the task-based fMRI findings that were reported earlier. Um, people with SPD show exaggerated utilization of frontal neural resources and an SPD greater than normal thalamotemporal functional connectivity is observed. 
So overall, the findings are consistent with the concept that in SPD, frontal and temporal lobe compensation serves as a protective factor. And just a little bit about potential treatment implications is some work from Margaret McClure and our group uh, that was funded by a NARSAD Young Investigator Award uh, looking at um, guanfacine. So guanfacine is a alpha-2A agonist that um, postsynaptic postsynaptically works on the prefrontal cortex. Uh, so Margaret did a randomized trial where she gave guanfacine or placebo to people with schizotypal personality disorder, and they also got cognitive remediation and social skills training. And the individuals that got guanfacine, as you can see in the left here, got better on, this is the matrix cognitive consensus battery factor score for planning and organization. So they got better with guanfacine uh, compared to the placebo group. So I think targeting treatments in SPD that, that um, particularly target the frontal lobe is, is going to be an important area of research and treatment. Oop. Grant support. Missed the people there. I just want to thank all my collaborators. It takes a lot of uh, village to do this kind of work. The Mental Illness Research Education Clinical Center, got a few fellows in the audience there, shout out, and then the Mood and PD group at Mount Sinai. So thank you. And Carol, you're